Normally on a Monday, OG would be here, but you know what? He is celebrating Independence Day here in the United States. And if you're in the USA, I want to give you a special shout out. Happy day off for much of the nation. By the way, for everybody else around the world, happy Monday, just like every other Monday. But we especially, on behalf of the Stacking Benjamins family and the men and women of the Navy Federal Credit Union, want to give a special shout out to our armed forces, the men and women who protect us to make days like today exist. So happy Independence Day, everybody, from Navy Federal and from Stacking Benjamins. Let's go. Stack some Benjamins on our Rewind Week. Pre-recorded from Joe's mom's basement, welcome to another Rewind episode of The Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey everyone, I'm Griffin the Intern, or like my mailman has started calling me, The Fintern. You know, it's great to have Fintern written on my mail now. I can easily tell my real mail from spam, and I just avoid anything that has my real name on it. It's also amazing how with this new hack, I haven't received any bills. Maybe I should look into that actually. While I'm digging through the trash, you can dig into this bit of gold from a year ago. Today, we'll go back to our episode with Michael Brody Waite and hear him talk about going from drug addict to CEO and success coach. It's a crazy roller coaster of a ride, and he has so much to share that we can all learn from. He thought he'd be dead years ago from his drug addiction, and now he's running a successful business and helping others, all using three key principles he learned on his road to recovery. I wonder if he could help me go from Fintern to basement CEO. Ah, dreams. I don't want to spoil the whole interview, so let's crank it up. This show originally aired in 2020, so make sure to ignore any giveaways or specific thoughts about current events. Hmm, I wonder what current events were happening last summer. Anyways, enjoy Fintern Out. This is Daryl from Pennsylvania. When I'm not busy arguing with a four-year-old, I'm stacking Benjamins. No, Daddy. Live from Joe's Bob's Basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's Bob's neighbor, Doug, and it's National Twilight Zone Day here in the basement. You are about to enter a dimension not only of sight and of sound, but of financial peace of mind. Next stop, the basement zone. I'm your tour guide on this little journey, and today, you're going to leave your middle-class home where you listen to podcasts and head out to meet one man who casually dropped drugs. He went from addiction to CEO and success coach. The man's name? Michael Brody Waite. He's the man who will teach us to achieve balance, reclaim energy, and thrive in work and life. Next, should you update your asset allocation given the current pandemic circumstances? During our headline segment, we'll share suggestions. We'll also toss out the Haven Lifeline to Vanessa. And sure, we'll save time for my otherworldly trivia and now two guys who are caught in a time trap and they can't get out because they love podcasting too much baby it's joe and oh juju juju g Doug with the Twilight Zone meets bad Elvis impression. Welcome to Podcasting Monday. Hey, everybody. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And across the card table from me, the other guy caught in a trap, a time trap, and he can't walk out. It's Mr. OG. It's just a regular trap. I don't know that it's more like a bear trap. One of those ones that like clamps your leg down and you're just stuck there for like eight years with a microphone shoved against your face podcast podcasting boy we're like the ball and chain of podcasting or you're at the ball and chain i'm not entirely sure i I, I don't even know how any of this stuff but works. anyway we're both a stuck it is interesting here in the basement zone today because we got michael brody wait coming down here this uh gentleman had uh a uh, little tiny tiny issue with drugs 
and he's going to talk about how the lessons he learned not only help shape for him a better life, but also you won't have to go through his pain to get the amazing results that he's had. Fantastic interview coming up today with Michael Brody Wade, but also... Life is full of things to manage. Your work, your family, your plans, and your treatment. Consider Kesimpta, Ofatumumab 20 milligram injection. You can take it yourself from the comfort of home. If you're ready for something different, ask your healthcare provider about Kesimpta and check out the details at kesimpta.com. Brought to you by Novartis Pharmaceuticals Corporation. We've got a great show. We've got OG and I sitting here with our coffee, ready to bring you some headlines. Michael Brody Waite, who normally would be upstairs talking to mom, but he's on hold on dad shortwave today. So uh, let's get the party started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline comes to us from CNBC. This was out uh, last Wednesday. The Treasury launches 20-year bond to help fund the record borrowing needed this quarter. 20-year bond coming back. They launched it? This is uh, written by Jeff Cox. The Treasury Department's launching a new 20-year bond in an effort to fund a record level of borrowing the government will need to do this year to support the economy through the coronavirus pandemic. As part of its quarterly refunding, the department said it will introduce a 20-year coupon bond later this month. An auction May 20th will feature a sale of $20 billion worth as part of an effort to push the record-setting debt levels further out in terms of duration. Treasury's borrowing needs have increased substantially as a result of the federal government's response to the COVID-19 outbreak. Brian Smith, Assistant Secretary for Federal Finance, said in a statement, over the next quarter, Treasury's cash balance will likely remain elevated as Treasury seeks to maintain prudent liquidity in light of the size and relative uncertainty of COVID-19 related outflows. A lot of people, OG, don't know how Treasuries even work, but it generally is at the longest half that time, a, tw- a 20s kind of uh Kind well, of we some, have 30 year notes. Well, right? we do have 30s, correct. But the new 20 replaces some of the old uh, 10s, I think. Probably. I mean, people are putting a lot of emphasis on, oh my gosh, we're borrowing all of this money and yada, yada, yada. And it, it totally does suck. The interesting thing I saw this on the interwebs also is that this last round of borrowing, yes, the question like, how does this get paid for? You know, you got all this stimulus spending. Oh, they just spent $2 trillion and some went to people and some went to businesses and who who pays for all of this? Well, the government borrows the money. They auction off, just like you're talking about, a 20-year bond. And it's kind of like a reverse auction. Yeah. It's, it's not trying to auction it up. It's auctioning it down. Like, how much will you give me for this? And somebody goes, well, I'll, I'll take 1% interest. And somebody goes, I'll take, I'll take 9% tenths of a point of interest and I'll take seven tenths of a point of interest. It keeps going down until finally somebody stops. And then that's the number. They either get it all or that's what they sell that amount at. Well, I read that the last round of funding was around like 68 basis points, which in non-stupid finance, finance par pants, <laughs> it means like 0.68%. And somebody made the point on the internet that said, Hey, the government is borrowing insert number here, $2 trillion dollars at half a percent, basically. The interest payment, which is what that is, right? You got to have that interest. You pay the interest to the owner of that debt is minuscule relative to how much money they're borrowing. So it's actually a really good deal for the government to give this money to citizens and to businesses. And yeah, there's a lot of stupid places that the money went to. I can debate that, but it's not as terrible as everybody thinks. And I think if you thought about this from the perspective of a personal lender. You know, we talk about home buying and we talk about borrowing money for college education and things like that. Would your view of a mortgage payment be different if you could borrow the money at half a percent? For everybody out there that wants to pay their house off, I'm one of those people, right? We say it's a great deal, air quotes, if you can get your money at 3% or 3.5%. I got 15 year mortgage at 3%. I got 30 year mortgage at 3.5%. That's how great it is. Government goes, yeah, we just borrowed $2 trillion at. 0.68%. What would that do to all of the other things around? Well, there's some inflationary pressures and things like that, obviously, but it may not be as bad, I guess, as what everybody thinks. Even though it might know. still be horrible, 
it that, might be that you're mortgaging imaginable. Right. Even though even though you're mortgaging your future, the good news is you'll get to repay nearly dollar for dollar what uh, what you borrowed. Yeah, I mean, it, it, obviously, you and I will never see 0.7 percent interest rates on our borrowing. No, because you know the, we can't print money, we can't tax a citizenry like the federal government can. So. It's interesting anyway, to say the least. Let's put this in individual terms, get away from the government stuff, which is above our pay grade, which is this is why you always shop interest rates, right? You don't just go to the first bank and say, hey, what interest rate will you give me? Let's shop interest rates. The government does it. Businesses do it. You can't just take somebody's word for it. Hey, here's the prevailing interest rate. No, go out and shop five, six, seven, eight places. And by the way, something the government doesn't have to deal with, OG, but you and I do is that you know when it comes to use mortgages earlier, when it comes to mortgages, there are also fees on mortgages. And a lot of times mortgage lenders will tell you that comparing interest rates sometimes is like looking at everybody's best lie because one interest rate will look lower than another. But for you and I, different than than the way treasuries are sold, they'll pile on a bunch of fees to make up for the quarter point that they're losing by beating the other guy. Yeah, what you're if you're looking for it on the mortgage thing, the thing that you're trying to compare is what's called a good faith estimate, because that they're going to list out all of the checks that you've got to write and all the checks that they're going to write, how much it's going to cost for the appraisal, how much it's going to cost for this, that, and the other thing. We've recently gone through a mortgage refinance. Uh, what I liked about it was they actually broke those sections down into things you can negotiate with us, things you can't negotiate with us. <laughs> That's cool. That is Which cool. I thought was really great. It was like, you know, your credit report fee, $700. That was in the things you can negotiate. It's like, no, they should be 60 bucks. Yeah. That's how much FICO charges, you know? Yeah. Um, I didn't choose to negotiate any of those things because we got a great rate and it was almost zero on the closing cost side. But I did compare that to another company and it was markedly different, like you said. Yeah, that's well. Our second headline comes to us from Investment News. This is an industry website for financial advisors and financial professionals. The headline is, Advised 401k Investors Tend to Stay the Course, According to Morningstar. You see this, OG? Nope. Amid the first quarter's market volatility, 401k participants who use professional advice to help with their 401k plan investing we're more likely to sit tight than self-directed investors, research by Morningstar found. According to Morningstar, 5.7% of participants enrolled in the 401k plan as of December 31st changed their portfolio allocations during the first quarter, although the rate of change varied significantly based on how the participant was invested. Only about 2% of participants in target date funds and managed accounts change their portfolios, while more than 10% of participants who self-direct their portfolios made changes. I'm going to rewrite that headline to suit my needs. People who don't follow advice are five times more likely to panic. To panic. (laughs) So says Fidelity in recent study. Now, I know what a lot of people who don't have either professional advice in their corner or have a target date fund are saying to their device right now, OG, they're saying, but this is really bad. And people with advisors wrote it all the way down. And I didn't. Uh There's a bigger problem here, folks. Well, I think also, to be fair, the people who are listening to this are most likely to be in the either 98% or the 90% of people who didn't do anything. True. You know, which is really funny. When we hear back from people who when we talk about these articles, because we hear back from people like, you got us totally pegged wrong, man. We didn't do anything. It's like, I know because you're the smart ones. Because <laughs> you're actually, you're brilliant. Yes. Because you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. The problem with market timing is that it just sounds so great. It's just, it's just really sexy. It's like, why, why take any of the loss? You could just sell out now and then, you know, you just buy back later type of thing. And it's like a death by a thousand paper cuts. You know, you, it just sounds really cool. It's rational. It makes a ton of sense. Hey, I'll just give up a little of the upside. I mean, you know, who cares? I'm, I'm not going to, at least I'm not taking all the downside. And that never works. Or maybe it works on half of the trade and it doesn't work on the other half of the trade. Or you get lucky this time and then you try it five years later during the next market correction and five years after that, five years after that, five years after that, and it never works again. 
And so you've lulled yourself into this belief system. It's just, it's just impossible to pick the bottom and the top. I just think about those people and how hard it is to sleep. Like you're sitting every day going, are we at the bottom? You know, these people are watching this run up that the stock market has had lately off the bottom going, oh, did I miss it? Oh, did I miss it? Oh, it, it, I, I, oh, man, I hope it goes back down again. I hope it goes back. Are, are you kidding me? Well, well, that's the thing. You have to bet on the unlikely event to be right. So let's say, for example, that you happen to be right on February 19th or 20th, and you said, you know what? I'm getting all my money out. You are not thinking on March 23rd, pull up the, pull up the Wall Street Journal from March 23rd, you know, uh, or March 24th, pull up Newsweek. I don't know. Is that still a magazine? <laughs> It just shows how many I read, you know, look at the headlines on Yahoo Finance or whatever from March 23rd in the evening or March 24th in the morning. It did not scream by, it did not say, you know what, the market's down 32%. That was probably the time to put all your money back in. It said like, oh my God, there's still half more to go. If you thought the great recession was terrible, just wait till you see what happens with coronavirus. And listen, it may end up being the case. We don't have any idea. We're recording this in May of 2020. The market could go back down again over the summertime and, and be lower than it was March the 23rd, or it may not. But what we know is, is that 70% of the time the market goes up. So if it happens to go down and then tomorrow it goes down and the next day it goes down and next week it goes down and the week after that it goes down and the week after that it goes down and the week after that it goes down, after that it goes down what did you just pile up? You just piled up a whole bunch of those 30% of the time the market goes down. And we have 100 years of market data to suggest that seven out of 10 periods of time, it goes up. So if you've got a whole bunch of periods of time where it goes down, it just stands to reason that it has to go back up and you're not going to pick it. You did not sit there on Christmas Eve two years ago and go, stocks are down 20%. This is a great time to invest. You did not sit there on the 23rd. If Never. I know the exact opposite that happened personally know the exact opposite that happened on March 23rd. We're a professional advisor who manages client money. I use advisor in air quotes. I was going to say, did the opposite of this article. We're right. Most, most like 99.9% .9 of managed money said, you got to sit. One oh, he sat one all the way until March 23rd. But that's my the point. Exact bottom. That shows how deep the desire is. To move, you actually had one pro that you have seen who actually who cracked, even a pro cracked. Yeah, to the tune of like three hundred million dollars of client money. I mean, just ridiculous. It was a mess. Now, here's good. the thing: if the last eight weeks or ten weeks or twelve weeks has caused you to feel concerned about the variability in your portfolio, so what do we do with all of this information? This is where we're going to go with this. If it's caused you to feel concerned about the ups and downs, if it's caused you to have some sleepless periods of time, and that's a real thing, you know, people really have that associated with their money. I mean, I feel that way. Joe, I know you feel that way. And I know you felt that way when you had clients. We're responsible for a lot of stuff for a lot of people. And you remember this sensation too during the recession and during 9-11. Uh, it's frustrating to not feel that you have any control over it. But if it caused you real panic, if it caused you real consternation, as things begin to normalize, whatever that looks like, you have to revisit your investment policy and say, hey, I don't want to play that game anymore. That range of ups and downs wasn't what I expected it to be. And if that was you, where, hey, I had all of my money in the S&P 500 because that's just what the internet told me to do because I put all my money in Vanguard total market or I put all my money in, you know, whatever the ticker symbol is for Vanguard's uh, S and P fund, because that's what the internet said, because the last 10 years, that's been the thing that's done best. So by default, I just kept buying more of it. And then all of a sudden I got 40% of it taken away in the span of a few weeks. And it really scared me. You have to revisit your investment policy and say, okay, if that bothers me, then I have to take a little bit of that off the table. And that looks like reallocation. It looks like having a better asset allocation, which may, God forbid, include things like fixed income at 0.68%, like we talked about 20 minutes ago. But it allows for better variability, or at least more controlled variability. 
people say that's risk. It's not, it's variability. And if that makes you feel more comfortable, then now you have to say, well, now my goals have changed or the money that my goals are going to support has changed. I can't plan on getting 10% anymore. I got to plan on getting seven. And then that means I have to do something different. So you can see how this all like cascades into other decisions. You can't just throw it against the wall and see what happens. Or you can't just say, well, I didn't like that. So I'm going to, I'm going to go 60, 40 mix from now on. I'm at 60% stocks and 40% fixed income. Whew, I feel better. It's like, well, but hold on. That changes things down the line. Yeah. It changes your, your expected growth rate. It changes your growth rate during retirement and before. Right. So that means you have to do other things. Does it mean you have to, did you just cost yourself two years of retirement? That might be the case. And that's, that's okay. Well, but that's why I don't like the risk tolerance questionnaires that a lot of people take when they start their job. They'll go into the 401k and they'll say, how much risk do you like? Well, I don't like any risk. I don't like any. Which is, <laughs> which, which is fine. But like Stephen Covey says, when you pick up one end of the stick, you pick up the other end. Meaning if I take no, if I take no short term risk with my money and I get 2%, my money's never going to grow. And because of that, I have to save dollar for dollar for retirement. So I will very safely never go anywhere versus the stock market over short periods of time, which is horrible, is a fantastic place if you look at 10, 15, 20 years historically. So, you know, stocks and real estate are the two inflation beaters over long periods of time. But also you don't buy a house if you want to sell it in a year. I know that personally because the because <laughs> how's that working out for you? Yeah, the cost on that thing getting in and getting out will smoke you over yeah. a short period of time. So you buy property and you buy stocks for long periods. Yeah. So if you decide because of a risk tolerance thing that you aren't going to take any risk with your money, you probably won't save enough to get where you want to go. Yeah. There's more decisions that come out of that decision basically. So, or just market time, you know, it's more fun day trade, do what Reddit tells you to do. There's a great, Oh, I wish that we had time to cover it, but <laughs> our friend, uh, Ramit, who wrote, I will teach you to be rich yes. and had a tweet the other day that uh, he screen grabbed from Reddit. And it was basically this whole paragraph of here's why this is different. And you can't buy and hold and you can't reinvest your dividends. You have to day trade the heck out of the market to be successful from now on, you know, <laughs> written by some internet bot slash 20 year old know it all. Right. You know, with a lot of life experience, bucks his, 800 bucks in his Robin hood account after <laughs> going long USO at six, <laughs> 10. <laughs> some but, by the way, that was for, for the 30% of our audience that knows what the hell you just said. It's hilarious. Exactly. <laughs> for, for everybody else, just trust us. It's hilarious. You should laugh. Yes. Yes. Just laugh along when you don't get the joke, but you know, everybody around you is laughing. Just, just, uh, but just, the punchline of it was, that he just said, hey, I, I really feel terrible <laughs> for people who their first foray into finance is. I'm going to see what the Reddit thread seems to think. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think that's uh, probably piece number one. Love Reddit, but uh, love hanging out on Reddit. Read a lot of fun stuff on Reddit. I would not take my financial advice from just from any forum. Uh, that's number Podcasting forum, on the other hand. Yes. Totally yes. legit. Two dudes you don't know podcasting on the internet. I'd take all their advice. No, number, number that that goes contrary to what we tell people in our end of the show thing, but uh, but we'll go with that one. And then uh, our second takeaway, I think, from this is interest rates. Compare the rate, compare the term, compare the fees, and uh, then you're going to do a good job when you have to borrow money. Well, I don't know if you've uh, spent much time watching TED videos, but the number one talk in the history of TEDx Nashville is a video called Great Leaders Do What Drug Addicts Do. And it's uh, by the guy who's sitting on hold on my dad's shortwave. Michael Brody Wait had a 17 year journey from addiction and near homelessness. We're going to get into that, I'm sure, with him to CEO and co founder of an Inc. 500 startup that he sold to a publicly traded company. He now has a program he calls the mask free program and uh maybe we'll talk to him about that too because i walked into a 
Menards yesterday here locally, OG. Got to put my mask on, one that mom made that looks all cool. Everybody else is wearing these these horrible masks, you know, the the, the little uh, the little temporary throw them away masks. Oh, they don't throw them away though. They throw them on the ground. Yeah, they throw them right. I've seen more masks on there, which is horrible. Come on, people. Bat and gloves just littering the but i've got sidewalk. a i've got a fantastic mask anyway he's got a mask free movement and it's not because he's anti and <laughs> it's not because he's anti wearing a mask in public i think he's talking about something else but let's find out michael brody wait on my dad shortwave and on my dad shortwave michael brody wait joins us how are you man I'm good, man. How are you? I'm well. I'm fantastic now that you're here because I can't wait for our audience to hear your story because you you have a story unlike. Uh, and I'm laughing, but there's really not a lot to laugh about. It is a an amazing story. Uh, and before we get to it, I do have to ask you this: Is it tough telling this story over and over and over that we're about to tell? It's tough in the sense that I believe that ego is the enemy of happiness. And so, you know, telling my story can stroke it uh, sometimes, but I feel incredibly honored and blessed to be able to carry this message. And so if what I have to share, there's a lot of people that can relate to what I have to share and they don't talk about it. So if what I have to share helps one person, it's worth it. Well, so let's start with your life today, just to juxtapose what we're about to talk about. Tell me about you today, because man, you've got a lot of cool stuff going on. Uh, you know what? I, I am very fortunate. So I'm a father and a husband. Uh, we have a 15 month old daughter and another child on the way. And I am an author of a book, a speaker, and I coach leaders on how to be great leaders. I've been very fortunate that I had a career in corporate America for eight years as a corporate executive. I founded my own company, an E500 company, and then I ran a nonprofit that helped 2,000 entrepreneurs a year start or grow a business. And now I just spend all of my time helping people unlock their potential using some really different tools and perspectives <laughs> to say the least. But it's, it's really enjoyable. And at the same time, it's really freaking scary. Well, my first thought is when you tell me about you today, you think about you being a dad back in the day, like way back then, would you have ever thought that you would ever be a dad? Actually, yes, because I engage in a lot of risky behavior. So I actually am surprised <laughs> that I'm not a father seven yeah. times over. Could I father a child? Yes. Was I even able to take care of myself? No. So the hopes of me being able to take care of anyone an adult, child, a pet, a plant. There was no way I could do that back then. So no, it's a privilege to be able to be a father. It's really uncomfortable. You know, I have found out being a father, there's a lot of stuff that people don't talk about. Like everybody said, oh, you don't, you're not going to sleep. No one told me that I would feel like a reluctant tourist in my own home that didn't have a connection with my daughter and resented my situation. Like nobody told me that I might feel that. But when I started telling people that I was going through that, they're like, oh yeah, me too. At the beginning, it gets better. I'm like, well, you told me about the lack of sleep. You didn't tell me about this. Yeah. So it's a unique experience to be able to actually really be present and be authentic and all that kind of stuff in this process. At the same time, it's part of my goal is to teach my daughter that she never has to hide her true self and she's able to talk about the hard things. So, well, and that's what I was, and there's a big difference, I guess, to draw the line between what you said that you're surprised that you're not a father, big difference between fathering a kid and being a dad. I mean, yeah. really being a parent. Yeah. I'm still wrapping my brain around the ladder. Yeah, well, uh, I'm still trying to figure that out. Dude, my kids are 24 and I'm still wrapping my brain around that. <laughs> That's what everybody tells me. They're like, good luck. Let me know when you figure it out. I got people that like have grandkids and like, we still don't know. That'll but, be, you know, it'll teach number, you a lot about yourself for sure. But no, I, I never, th dude, I, I did not expect to be alive. I expected to be dead at least 11 years ago, let alone being a husband and a father. Well, let's start off with slipping down that slope. When did you first get started with drugs? So I started experimenting in high school and then in college, you know, I never really felt like I had the instructions for how to deal with life on life's terms. And I always felt less than, and I found that when I put alcohol or drugs in my body, I could control the way I felt and I felt better and I felt numb. And so by my junior year in college, I had become fully addicted, you know, from the minute I woke up to the minute I passed out at night, my only obsession was to get and stay high. And I ended up getting kicked out of school. Uh, I got kicked out of my house, got fired from my job. My car was repossessed. 
And the only thing I wanted to do was to chase that high. And it was a pretty fast progression. I mean, you know, basically from age 20 to 23, I went from, you know, Fulbright college student to homeless drug addict. When you were going through that and you're kicked out of school, you're kicked out of, out of your apartment. How did you come up with money? I didn't uh, necessarily. I stole other people's money. You know, the only thing keeping me from living on the street was a friend's apartment. He let me stay there for a weekend and a weekend turned into three months. I was like the most horrible house guest ever overstaying his welcome and sleeping on the floor and sleeping on the couch. And when he would go to work during the day, I would steal his money, drink his liquor, eat his food and invite strangers over to wreck his place. Um, that wasn't obviously going to last, but that at the end there, I had nothing, man. I couldn't even afford a belt to hold my pants up. So like I had to rely on whatever way, I, uh, whatever means I could use to get money. Yeah. It was amazing reading about holding your pants up with, with a rope, uh, so that you could get the pants to stay on. It's just so symbolic for me. I mean, you know, it's you think about, oh, no belt, that's not that big of a deal. But like you walk around in the same pair of pants every single day in the same shirt because you can't afford any clothes and they don't even fit. Nothing tells you you feel like you're living someone else's life more than wearing someone else's clothes. People started to tell you or tried to tell you were going down the wrong path. What happened when people would bring it up that, hey, things don't look like they're going great for you? Uh, I would avoid them at all costs. And I would argue with them and tell them that I was in control and that I had this thing figured out. And I would basically, I would avoid every difficult conversation that came my way. It is so amazing. When did you, well, well, tell me one more story. There's a story you're driving in your car or somebody's car and you are super high and these cops pull up next to you in your book. Can you yep. tell that story? Yeah, man. So uh, it was my parents' car. Uh, they would let me borrow it for a weekend because my car had been repossessed and I was loaded and I saw an advertisement for a Big Mac and I was like, oh, I have to get one of those. And so I was living in LA. And so I went driving down Sunset Boulevard to the McDonald's down on Sunset Boulevard in LA. I was driving back and I had the windows down, the music really loud, and I was speeding. I was reckless. I'm really lucky I didn't die or kill someone. And at a stoplight, like every time there was a stoplight, I would just floor it the second it would hit green. Like you would think you would know you're loaded. You shouldn't be drawing attention to yourself, but I would just floor it because I wanted to go fast. And at the next, at one of the stoplights, this cop pulls up next to me flashes his lights, rolls down his window. And I'm like, oh, here it is, man. And there was such a hope. Like, I actually felt relief, man. I felt like, oh my God, finally, I can stop spinning all these plates. And all he did was motion to me, hey, slow it down. And then he just kept going. And while I was grateful that I wasn't going to end up in handcuffs that night, I was actually kind of disappointed. Which is amazing. And you said, well, it sounds like you, did, you, you didn't explicitly say this, was that your low point? Was that the low point? I would say the low point was a night where I decided I looked myself in the mirror. I didn't recognize who I was. I've been wearing a mask, hiding my true self behind everybody, including myself and not showing what was really going on. And finally, I woke up one day, I looked in the mirror and I actually saw myself for the first time and I did not recognize myself. And I said, I can't keep going on like this. And so I wanted to kill myself. And I wanted to do it through overdose. And one of the reasons I wanted to do that was because I never felt like I was high enough. And so my hope was I could feel high enough before I died, which is really sad to share, but it's how I felt. And so that night I used more than I ever had. This part isn't in the book necessarily, but I used more than I ever had. And for five minutes, I felt high enough and I didn't die. I didn't even pass out. But after that, I wanted more and I just like started to cry. And I was like, dude, I can't even keep up with this. I can't even do this right. I can't even kill myself right. I can't even use right. I, this is just, I'm so tired. I can't do this anymore. Yeah, you said the drugs were easy. It was, it was everything around it. Life around it was really hard. Like being, being on drugs was super duper hard. Yeah. You know, people think it's like a party lifestyle, right? Like you, you watch a movie or whatever and all that kind of stuff. If you're a hardcore addict and you're losing everything, like, it is a full-time job fixing, managing, controlling so that you can acquire your drugs or whatever it is that you use and then find a place to do them and then manage through the experience. And then while you're doing that, thinking about how am I going to get more so I don't come down? That is a full-time job. I've never worked a job that was harder than being a drug addict. And I've worked some really hard jobs. You, you end up in rehab 
and you think to yourself, and I actually laughed here because you think, man, I'm nailing rehab. Like I, I, I'm rocking the rehab and I'm thinking, Mike, I'm thinking I'm 52 years old. I've never, I've never known somebody just rock rehab. And, and you're spending a lot of time in these group discussions coming up with like great ways to tell your story, sexy ways to tell your story. And then one day, one day you had enough. And I think this is really core to who you are now. You're trying to impress this guy, Tim, and you're trying to impress everybody in the group. Yeah. Tell me about the day that you broke down and, and uh, well, everything kind of changed that day. Yeah, man. So for the first six months I was in recovery, when I would share in a group, I didn't even know what a TED talk was. I had no idea I would one day give one, <laughs> but I was like trying to give a TED talk. Right. And I didn't realize, but I was, I was trying to get liked. I was trying to be the cool guy. Um, you're not cool when you're a drug addict, by the way. So I was managing everybody's perception. And yet at the same time, at about six months, I started to experience some really significant internal emotional pain and challenges staying clean. And I really wanted to use, I was going through a really hard time. And there's a saying that you can't save your face and your butt at the same time. And when I walked into that meeting, I knew that I couldn't do a choreographed share. I really needed to share for real because I was scared to death that I was going to use. And for me, one of the things I knew was if I use, I'm going to die. Like I would one shot at this thing in my mind. So I go into the meeting and I share, and I think it's the worst share ever. Like I'm just, you know, I'm, I was so vulnerable. I was all over the place. It was really messy. Um, nothing was tight. It was not a Ted talk. Uh, if it had been a Ted talk, no, it would have zero views on YouTube. <laughs> and, and so I, I truly believe they're going to like kick me out because I'm such a waste and I suck. Like it really, and you have to think about that, that frame of mind. You're surrounded by other drug addicts and you think you're not enough to sit in that circle. Like that's how low I, I thought of myself. And so after the meeting, uh, this guy named Tim comes up to me and he was this like old timer that 15 years clean. He had all this Harley leather and he was like this tough guy. And I totally thought he was going to like pick on me because that's what happens when you show vulnerabilities, you get picked on, right? I thought he was going to punch me in the freaking face. And he goes, dude, that was a great share. And I'm like, Tim, that was the worst share ever. He's like, no, that's the best share ever. That's the first time you ever shared real. Like, that's what we have to do here. That's what it takes to stay clean. That's what it takes to live. And I saw the real Michael for the first time. And I want to get to know that guy. That was the first time anyone had ever told me being my true self was the most important thing. And that was certainly the first time that anyone ever told me that my life depended on it. And it came from someone who I thought would be the least likely person to tell me that. It's so amazing. And now it's, it's really the basis of a lot of work that you do, because it's funny, you and I are sitting here talking at a time when everybody is walking around wearing a mask, right? And we're all, Physically, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we're all better for it. And you're saying not, 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 uh, literally take off them. Please literally do not take off the mask, but, no, fi but, wear it <laughs> yeah. yes, but figuratively in business, you start going into business, you work your way up the corporate ladder, and you all of a sudden realize that everybody around you is wearing a mask. Tell me about what you saw in corporate America when you got there. Yeah, man. So here's the thing. So drug addicts, we do four things really well we, when we're in active addiction. We say yes to drugs instead of saying no. We hide our weakness, which is our addiction. We avoid any difficult conversation that's going to lead to an intervention. And we hold back whatever beautiful, unique perspective we are equipped with because we're blunted by the drugs and alcohol. When I got clean, they told me I had to practice these principles in all my affairs, including professional. And so when I found myself surrounded by all these really distinguished professionals with great degrees and they all looked great, they were all preppy and stuff. And here I am with long hair and you know, hoop earrings and I don't feel like I belong. I realized that I was just like them because when I looked at them, and this is true in every individual team and organization across the world right now in business, people are saying yes when they could say no to projects, emails, tasks, whatever. They're hiding their weaknesses because they don't want people to think that they can't do something. They're avoiding difficult conversations with their boss, their coworkers, the customer, their significant other. And they're holding back their unique perspective. They're not saying, I don't know. They're not saying, I don't agree with that. Or they're not showing when the boss's boss is in the room, what their unique perspective is. And so when I felt surrounded by all this, I was like, I get it. They're hiding behind a mask to get what they want. I did that. As a drug addict, I hid behind a mask to get the high. They're doing it to get success. Hiding behind the mask, by the way, pays a lot better when you're just doing it for success versus the drugs and alcohol. But I couldn't do it. I, like I truly felt like it would be a relapse if I started doing it. So I said no. I shared my weakness aggressively. 
I leaned into the difficult conversations. I didn't hold back my unique perspective and I thought it would make me an outcast. And honestly, it did. It made me an outsider to the culture. It also made it so that my mentors became my employees and I got promoted eight times in eight years because I was more efficient, more trusted, more effective. And I was able to leverage what made me me. And that was not because I got an MBA or corporate training. It's these four things that everybody does in business that every recovering addict has actually learned how not to do. When you say that you were an outsider, businesses are about people. They're about relationships. Are you saying you were an outsider with the, I guess, the wrong group of people, the status quo people? Because if you're getting promoted, there's somebody who's looking at you and says, that's the guy. That's the person. And it can't just be that you're great at your job because I don't know, in my years at American Express, there were some people that were great at their job that I always hoped never got promoted. Not that I was jealous. It was that they were wearing the biggest mask of any of us, right? A hundred percent. Just an outcast for all, in my mind, all the right reasons where it feels like you're the outcast for the wrong reasons. So like anywhere else, it's like high school, right? There's the cool crowd and they do, all, they do all the things that make you cool. Right. And so it's not the letter jacket and football. It's, you know, you, you look really smart in a meeting by, you know, saying the right things and all this kind of stuff. You do all the projects because I didn't hide my true self. I would do things that were not what the cool crowd did. So for example, I would be vulnerable. I'd be like, man, I'm really scared. Or I don't know how to use the, how to do this at all. They'd be like, hey, Mike, you know how to do this thing, right? Most people say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd be like, no, actually, I have no idea how to do it. Will you teach me? And that, and that vulnerability scared people because they want to judge it as weak. And in reality, it's what creates strength. But also, um, I wasn't scared to say no to things. I wasn't scared to speak my mind um, because facing drug addiction is a lot harder than being odd man out in a corporate culture. And I think that so many people worry about the critic. They don't realize that they have the opportunity to lift up the person that can identify with their story. And so what I found was, yes, a lot of people made fun of me for being this vulnerable guy or saying no to things or whatever. But there were all these people that would just flock to me like a magnet because I was actually like showing my true self and they wanted to know how or I mean, just think about practically like with a customer. If you have a customer and they say, hey, you can do this thing, right? Everybody says, yeah, yeah, we can do that thing. Please give us a sale. And be like, actually, we're not good at that. That didn't make me popular with my colleagues. It made me popular with my customers, which got me more sales. And then I got, and then my bosses wanted to hire me because I got more sales. They didn't care how I did it, you know? And so it's just this perpetuating cycle of you act differently and the people that yearn for that want to connect with you. And so it was a, it's what enabled me to be successful. It, it, it reminds me of, of a couple of things. I had a leader once at American Express and and he was a little goofy. He was incredibly vulnerable. He didn't dress like a lot of the other people uh, that were in management. And I remember talking to leaders around him. He led our group, leaders around him, and they would always make fun of Chris. They they'd say, yeah. "Oh, oh, he's goofy." Chris ended up really succeeding. It took him a little longer, Michael, but man, when he went, he went like a rocket ship because everybody who worked for Chris knew that Chris didn't care what the person on his right or his left said. He just cared that the people who were his flock, that he took care of them because that was his job. And so it was people like me and the people that I worked with who were under him who ultimately got him promoted. I remember talking to Chris's boss's boss one time if there was an event, we were having drinks and he said something about Chris being goofy. I'm like, yeah, he's kind of goofy, but he's the best boss I ever had. And I remember this guy, Chuck, going, what are you talking about? Like, no. And I remember management guru, Tom Peters, you're probably familiar with Tom. Tom talks about real power comes from those people, comes from your customers, comes from your flock, doesn't come from kissing your boss's ass and telling them what they want to hear. Well, I also think that like everybody identifies what being a great leader is, and then they try to go do that. But we aren't taught that being our true selves makes us a great leader. So what we actually do is we become really effective followers. Yeah. Great leaders lead themselves and they take unpopular stances. Winston Churchill, Abraham Lincoln, Rosa Parks, like we have a litany of people that took the unpopular stance. Being your true self when it doesn't conform to what everybody thinks is cool is the ultimate form of leadership. And so even the people, this is what I found. A lot of those cool kids that made fun of me, they're following me now. They're reading my book now because the truth is, is that they want to be able to express their true selves too. Nobody wants to, to struggle with a weakness and not share it and ask for help. Like no one actually wants to do that. We're just so scared that if we don't do what everybody else is doing, we're not going to get what everybody else has got. 
But the truth is that you have a unique path to your success that only you can forge, but you have to be willing to accept that you're going to have the haters. Brene Brown in The Gifts of Imperfection talks a lot, uh, tells this great story about how she talked to this audience of 300 people. And there was this one guy in the front row that had his arms crossed that clearly hated her. And instead of trying to reach the other 299, she just tried to convince him all day, the entire night and got completely off her game and didn't carry her message because she was trying to meet the haters perspective. And it was just, it's so counterintuitive to leadership, but that, that's how leadership is taught. We all get there. I mean, I think about the time I obsess over the person who says, you know, that our show stinks versus yeah. the 500 people who say that it's great. I mean, I could get five-star reviews all day long. One person leaves a one-star review. I am, I'm a mess for eight hours. Dude, you know what I had to learn? Um, I do a lot of speaking engagements and workshops and I did workshops for corporations and they would hire, like a boss would hire me and bring me to come in. And I'd be like, hey, I believe that great leaders live like drug addicts. If you use the principles that recovering addicts use to recover, you can become a great leader. And then I would do all my sharing and my whole process and every time I would get two different responses, the crossed arms, like, screw you, dude. Like, I'm going to show you my letterman jacket that's in my closet at home. You don't fit. And then the person that goes, oh, that I just created an oasis and they go, oh my God, like, where has this been my whole life? And my problem was I always felt like a failure when I walked out because I wanted everybody to think that what I was saying was awesome. What I have to accept is, is that the cost of leading myself and reaching the people that I'm supposed to reach means I'm going to not always meet everybody's expectation. But it's I, I'm just like you. I will respond to the one critic in my mind. I, 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 I think I, it's totally, totally all of us. The book is Great Leaders Live Like Drug Addicts. Comes out in a couple of weeks, but you've got some uh, cool pre-order stuff going on, Michael. Yeah, man. If you go to michaelbrodyweight.com or greatleaderbook.com, whichever is uh, easier to remember, my last name is Jack. So you'll probably remember greatleaderbook.com. <laughs> I think uh, hyphenated names are badass, by the way. Thank you. Yes, Just... I know. We are a unique, a very <laughs> unique, authentic crew. And my dream was to marry a woman who had a hyphenated last name and then we could hyphenate them. And then I could totally screw my children even more than the way my parents screwed me up. Evil genius. You are an yeah. evil genius. <laughs> and, exactly. and you know what? We will link to the book so you can get the audio book as well on our show notes page at stackybedjamins.com. Man, Michael, I know it's got to be tough telling the story over and over. So thanks for coming in and telling our listeners because I think you helped a lot of people today. Dude, thank you for being interested in the story and you keep being your unique self. It's pretty awesome. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and the year 2020. Strange times have befallen us here in the basement zone. The pandemic has forced the crew to shelter in place. Toilet paper has become the local currency. Don't think about asking for hand sanitizer. It's long gone. But the strangest mystery of all, neighbor Doug's stashes of treats hidden all throughout the basement are dwindling. Something, something from the supernatural has penetrated the cinder block basement walls and is abducting the snacks. What supernatural force, we ask you? Why do they need Doug's snacks? This is a mystery in the basement zone. Ponder today's question. What was the name of the host of the Twilight Zone? I'll be back with your answer faster than you can interdimensionally travel to the answer. The following is an actor, not a real person. We tried to find an actual Stacking Benjamins podcast listener, but we're not sure any exist. Yesterday, I turned on one of those other podcasts. Ugh, more money talk? The topic was something called long-term care, and they couldn't even make me care for the short term. That podcast made me feel like just another number. Hi, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, the huge star of the award-winning Stacking Benjamin Show. Are you tired of podcasts that blabber on about money? Are you confused about all this IRA, SEPP, 72T, and fiduciary talk? At Stacking Benjamins, you're not just another number to us. Heck, if you actually listen, you're the only number. That's why we barely ever talk about money. Better yet, we treat you like family. 
We'll invite you on down to Joe's mom's basement, serve you some pie and maybe even a little lemonade. And best yet, when you leave, we'll complain about you behind your back. Because that's what real family moments are all about. I'm never going back to that old podcast. Stacking Benjamins is a way for me to avoid numbers and feel that warm, fuzzy feeling I get every time I scream at my sister on the phone. Stacking Benjamins, where you're not a number, your family. Did you know with the More Rewards credit card from Navy Federal Credit Union, you can earn three times the points at supermarkets, food delivery, and gas, plus one point on everything else? Your rewards won't expire while your account's open, and you can redeem them for cash, travel, gift cards, and more. So stackers, if you pay your bill off in full every month and you're not paying interest, you'll know that the More Rewards card has some pretty special rewards. Plus, the More Rewards card is contactless, so you can make payments quickly and securely with just a tap of the card. Speaking of rewards, you can get a Navy Federal Auto Loan and reward yourself with that new ride to get to work. Applying is easy. You can do it on their mobile app, online, or by phone, and it's super fast. You can get a decision in seconds. Right now, rates are as low as 1.79% APR. Plus, with Navy Federal's car buying service, Power by True Car which will save you hundreds or thousands of dollars. Don't don't go to Navy Federal and get a car without using Navy Federal's car buying service powered by True Car. It is amazing. Coupled with that 1.79% APR, I think they've got you covered. So with that, you can shop, you'll compare and save on your new or used car. So whether it's your first car or your dream car, Navy Federal can help you cruise into a car that you can afford. At Navy Federal, our members are the mission. Insured by NCUA, open to the armed forces, the DOD, veterans, and their families like me. American Express is a registered service mark of American Express used by Navy Federal under license. Credit and collateral subject to approval, rates subject to change, and are based on creditworthiness rate available for new vehicles. Message and data rates may apply. Visit NavyFederal.org for more information and to apply. This episode is brought to you by Simply by Frito-Lay. These days, you have a lot going on. But now, thanks to Simply by Frito-Lay, you have one less thing to worry about. So kick back and enjoy your favorite Frito-Lay snacks with ingredients to feel good about, like Simply Blue Corn Tostitos, Sea Salted Ruffles, and even White Cheddar Cheetos Puffs, all made with no artificial colors or flavors. Enjoy what you love and look for Simply brand snacks online or at a store near you. Oh, look, it appears your ride is here to take you to your thrilling answer to today's trivia down in the basement zone. You may remember or think you remember that every stash of treats in the basement is mysteriously disappearing. I hid some of my snacks in the chutes and ladders game box. No one ever plays that game. They should have been safe and sound, but no, gone, up in smoke, without a trace. What about the candy stashed in an expired box of Raisin Bran at the end of the basement shelves? Yes, M-I-A. Whatever supernatural force this is has a nose for all the secret hiding places. It's a quandary. And... Not as easy as today's trivia answer. Since today is Twilight Zone Day, what was the name of the host of this iconic show? The original series ran for a total of five seasons and 156 episodes, first airing in 1959 and concluding in 1964, hosted by none other than Rod Serling. He wrote most of the episodes himself and retained creative control. Now, if only I could find a way to control this outlaw who's been stealing my candy here in the basement zone. Big thanks to Michael for hanging out with us today. What an amazing story. I mean, when you go from being a guy who is stealing from your friends, 
just to get more into your system, which by the way, not a great place to be. Right. To uh and then fixed it. Yeah. Yeah, to fixing it. And not only fixing it, but also being able to share with people that it is this idea of being completely yourself, being absolutely rigidly yourself. Where did you learn that, OG, that you had to stop kissing up to everybody else and be true to you? Because I can tell you exactly when th that turn started for me. Ooh, I don't know that I have a time in mind. I guess I could probably I could probably ask around. I bet you other people know the answer to it for me. It was the end of my junior year of high school. And I remember there. I was thinking back. I'm like, okay, I'm 42. Let's see. Did I start that at 41? Probably not. <laughs> was it two weeks 40? ago? <laughs> I know. Three like, weeks ago. 40. What was I doing at 40? All right. When we moved to Texas in 2015, it was around then. And you're like, yeah, when I was a kid, I really saw that. I'm like, oh, shoot, I'm way off. <laughs> well, it was definitely a long journey. And, you know, to some degree, you're always trying to be what other people want you to be. But, but that sure. journey for me began my junior year of high school, there was a guy who was, you know, one of the popular crowd dudes. And I just remember one day he was making fun of me and I went, you know what? I really don't care what you think, Tom. I seriously do not care what you think. And it was amazing just how liberating, I still remember how liberating that thought was and how it really changed the course of a lot of things that I did from that point on. I went to a military college basically halfway across the nation from me because I didn't care. And I was going to do what was right for me at that time. And by the way, for me at that time, I desperately needed military college. I remember I opened up the letter from the Citadel in my bedroom and it was just this absolute hellhole, like a bomb went off, right? Like probably a lot of teenagers. And uh, I remember the, the brochure said the Citadel where manhood meets mastery and I'm opening it up as I'm kicking clothes aside and I look around my room and I literally thought, I think this is what I need. I think, <laughs> I think this is exactly what I need in my life. And none of it stuck. And none of, yeah. <laughs> I wish I had, which is a whole nother issue. Wish but. I had learned something. Hey, let's get off that topic and uh, throw out the Haven Lifeline. We're going to tackle some of life's most important questions. OG, our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, you know what they do? They put, what you value first. Well, in keeping with your Citadel story, I am desperately trying to teach my kids two things to do every single day. Make your bed when you wake up and brush your teeth. That's the drumbeat of our house. I'll walk by their rooms and I'll look in their bedroom and I'll say, did you recently take a nap? You know, if it's two in the afternoon, the bed's not made like, uh, no, I'll do it. I'm like, no, you have to do it immediately when you wake up. The first thing when your feet hit the ground, Make your bed. Why are you mad? Because it's just ugh, it's called discipline, and I will instill it in you if I have oh, to. Oh boy! You know, so help me God. Do you think at some point they're going to get the lesson? We're moving in that direction. Hopefully, it actually I've got says five years left with my <laughs> oldest. So, at best, he's we're right around sixteen, seventeen hundred days of me <laughs> nagging him about it. So, oh, I bet you're not the only one with a timer on that. I'm sure he's marking off the days <laughs> until he's not being nagged about making his bed. Of course, if he goes to the Citadel, he'll be, he'll be nagged for well, By then, maybe he'll actually do it. Yes. And when he goes to college, he'll be like, oh, I'm so glad my dad makes me make the bed every day because my dorm room doesn't look like a pigsty. I got really good at those tight corners, man. I'm like, pull the blankets up. We're not even like bouncing quarters or anything. We're just we're just all about like make it look neater. I do have to say when, when we knew there was an inspection, I was a master at T-pinning that bed down. Mm. But during inspection, all those T-pins came out at the last minute because you get cut, you get cut with those things. Not a good day. Uh, it says here, by the way, your loved ones and your time is the two things that are most important in your life. And that's why Haven Life is made buying quality term life insurance. Actually simple. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now, and you will get a free quote which I like because it's super easy, very fast. It's all online. You get an instant coverage decision. Prices are affordable. And of course, they're backed by a more than 160-year-old insurer, Mass Mutual. Today, we're going to throw the Haven Lifeline out to our new friend, Vanessa. Say hi, Vanessa. Hi, guys. Love the show. Wanted to get your opinion on two strategies I'm thinking of, which one you think might be best. I just was recently laid off due to Corona. 
However, since I've been working on my finances, listening to you guys show and others, I had about $2,000 saved up before that. My rent here in Brooklyn is, Brooklyn, New York, is $825 per month. I got through with unemployment. So that unemployment plus the extra $600 is going to be about $980, 960X after taxes each week. I'm also getting a severance from my job biweekly until the middle of May after taxes. That's going to be about $1,800 biweekly or so. And I got the full stimulus of $1,200. So question, should I pay off my student loans with this extra money that I'll be receiving or should I just pay the minimums for now and try and hold on to as much money as possible? My student loans are with the government. Balance is $3,700 and the interest rate is 2%. My personal loan, $16,000 balance. Uh, minimum is five seventy seven. dollars Minimum on the student loans, eighty seven, dollars And the personal loan is at 5% interest. I did have a credit card bill until yesterday when I took some of this money to pay it off in full. So I'm not in a bad place financially, actually. So the unemployment, everything else, and plus my savings, I'm, I'm in a pretty good place. Also, I work in the accounting field. So whenever I am ready to actually start job hunting, I'm pretty sure I'll get something because you always need people in accounting. What do you <laughs> And... And she hit the 90 second mark, unfortunately. Uh, but Vanessa, hey, stay safe there in Brooklyn. Glad to hear you got source of income coming in now. OG, what do you think? Does she pay off her debt or does she hang on to the money? This is 100% hang on the money. There's too much, too many unknowns going on. Obviously, it's a day to day, week to week, you know, month to month situation with some places. No one has any idea what's really going to happen. Everybody's got their own opinions about it. And some states are experimenting with those opinions. So we'll start seeing the effects of those experiments uh, over the next several weeks. But I think you can always go back and pay the loans off. It's going to be much more difficult to have the loan paid off and then ask for the money back to borrow. And out of the hierarchy of things, if you ended up coming back to needing debt, let's say you used all your cash and then something happened and you know the unemployment dried up or whatever it was, and now you need a few extra dollars where you're going to go back into credit card debt, which is worse than having student loan debt at 2%. So let's do this in the right order. Keep the cash once you get your job back or once you get a new job. And from a cash flow standpoint, you're feeling pretty confident. Then just take the lump sum and lump sum off, you know, what the, uh, what the difference would have been after you've accounted for making sure you've got a good cash position. So yeah, I get it. Maybe you're losing a few bucks on interest over the next couple of uh, yeah. over the next couple of months, but um, I'd rather be safe than sorry in this case. I'd even look, Vanessa, at that student loan because there are some federal student loans right now where that it, very low interest rate you already have, frankly, has been reduced to zero for the next few months. So I might even yeah. I might even check on that and and see if uh, if you even have to a pay anything because if you're on automatic payments with that, you'll know already because they haven't taken the payment out. If they don't take the payment out, you're automatically getting the uh, government help in the student loan area. If you do have to make a payment though, then you're probably not, uh, not eligible for that. But, but OG, I'm totally with you when you, when, when, this is the opposite advice that we would give. I think Vanessa, if she told us she had a job and she knew that it was secure if she had a job today and she knew that for whatever reason that that paycheck was going to continue, by all means, then either pay off the debt or or get moving, investing it either way. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for the question, Vanessa. Great question, especially for now with all the uncertainty. I'm sure there's a lot of people that have a similar question. If you have a question for us, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And uh, Gertrude, by the way, sending our new friend Vanessa some uh Haven Life, Stacking Benjamin's Greatest Money Show on Earth swag. All right, that's going to do it for today. Big thanks to, uh, well, thanks to a lot of people. Doug's going to handle that. If you're somebody, though, that uh, needs somebody to talk to during this time and you have a question that's a little more in-depth than we can handle here on the show, you want to talk to a pro without getting any sales pitch, OG is currently doing these, uh, something he hasn't done before, these uh, 30 minute discussions. And you've been telling me that those have been going really, really well. Packed every day. And it's super fun. I can't do it forever because I'm going to get real tired in a hurry. But um, yeah, you know, just fun helping people and just a quick conversation. 
I have yet to some, have somebody want to talk about football or something like that. They, really? There's a lot of, oh yeah. They, because you know, we, people are like, hey, I'd like to, but I've really got this other financial thing. So, yeah, because we threw uh, that out there. That. Dad yeah. jokes, football, you'll talk about all that stuff. Exactly. Yes. Uh, StackingBenjamins.com forward slash OG. If uh, you need some one-on-one time, it's uh, between that and uh, trying to do some uh, YouTube and Facebook hangouts trying to do OG as, as much as we can to help people out here. All right. That's going to do it for today. Doug, you got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our headlines. Try to steer clear of emotional investing decisions and stick to your plan so you can avoid tragedy when you're ready to spend your dollars. Second, take a lesson from Michael Brody Waite. Practice rigorous authenticity, surrender the outcome, and do uncomfortable work. You'll thank yourself. But the big takeaway. No real mystery here. It turns out that OG's stomach is a supernatural force. That guy's been spying on me long enough to find my hiding spots and has been stealing them ever since. Or, wait a minute, was it OG? Or just someone who looks like OG? I guess we'll never know here in the basement zone. Special thanks to Michael Brody Waite for coming down to the basement. You can find out more about Michael at greatleaderbook.com or on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rudder Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm a lot deeper than you realize. In fact, sometimes I just stand in front of my mirror and reflect. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. What happens in the after show stays in the after show. We don't talk about it. Back in Dallas a couple of years ago, the year that we won best podcast the second time, a gentleman named Deacon Hayes, who OG, I think you know as well, Deacon won for Well Kept Wallet best blog. Deacon is a dad. And like a lot of us, he's been going crazy during uh, coronavirus time, trying to be a good parent. So Deacon was on Facebook and uh, I wrote to him and asked if I could play this. This is the audio from Deacon Hayes from Well Kept Wallet about what he's been doing during coronavirus time. Day 53 of quarantine, getting a little stir crazy. I've got a new hobby though. I like to wrap children's books. This one's called Little Excavator uh, by Anna Dudney. Um, and I'm gonna wrap it to Warren G's Regulate or Regulator, something like that. Here come the 
the big rigs rolling down the street. Thump a thump a bump a bump a beep beep beep. Can you see little E ready on the spot? He's the little excavator working on the lot. Wham goes a dozer knocking down the walls. Rumble rumble crumble crumble fall fall fall. Little E is busy. He goes bam bam bam. Uh oh little excavator now you're in a jam. Graham goes a loader lifting up the trash. Push a push a push a push a smash smash smash. Little E is lifting up some junk junk junk. But there goes little excavator over with a clunk. June goes a dump truck with a load of love. Dunk a dunk a clunk a clunk a chug chug chug. Little E just wants to love all day day day. Look out little excavator don't get in the way. Grunt goes the backhoe digging in the dirt. Clang clang bang bang work work work. Little E is helping to you dig dig dig. Now your little excavator someday when you're big. The tall crane rising to the sky. Whoosh, 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 high, high, high. Little Lee is stretching, he gets tall, tall, tall. But time the next bed, they don't too small. Now there's one last job and the busy day is done. But no big ring can do it, not a single one. Everybody tries it and it's much too tight. But can it be little E fits just right? Oh. job little excavator time to take a bow there's work for you here and now you might be small little e but you will grow you're a mighty excavator go 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 <laughs> i have no talents of any kind whatsoever <laughs> I, saw, uh, I saw that i'm like deacon you are my hero you are my hero <laughs>